name, I pray, amen. All right, Brother Bill. Well, good evening. By the way, we forgot to put this in the prayer list, but uh, Brother Frank Trainer, a lot of you know him, his mom fell and she I, and broke her hip and some other issues, but they asked us to pray for her. And so if you'll remember that, Mrs. Trainer. All right, so we got a few announcements tonight. Don't forget VBS is coming up. That's going to be an exciting time. Amen. And uh, also, let's see here. They camp, pray for the campers. They're down there right now. I know Justin has called and said they've had some good services. And the boys are doing well, and praise the Lord for that. Amen. Don't forget it coming up on Sunday night. What is Sunday night after the service? Uh, <laughs> Old-fashioned Baptist potluck yes, is amen. on Sunday night. Amen. amen. And so you know how that always works, bring enough for your family and bring enough to pass, and there's always a lot of food left over. And don't forget the sign-up sheets that are on the back table for VBS. It's for the gifts, for those that are volunteering, and we could use all the help we can get. Amen? And then let's see. Also, I Love America Sunday coming up, and that is with Brother Chuck Harding, and I think you'll enjoy that immensely. He's been a, a blessing. We've known him since 1980. We graduated, He went to college together. He graduated before I did. But he's worked in Washington, D.C. with the politicians now for years, and he really loves the Lord, and, and it'll be a blessing to have him here. And then also... Uh, I had, what else was on my mind just then? Just went away. Anybody ever have that happen? It's happening more and more. Uh, okay, anyway, and then for Junior Church, don't forget these items for Junior Church. Water toys, squirt guns, amen, powerful, 45 caliber squirt guns, amen. And uh, T-shirts with no writing, 5T to 14. Metal toy cars, sunglasses, board games, individually wrapped snacks. Let me tell you what. Doing this for Junior Church helps grow Junior Church. Amen. These children love Junior Church. Amen. I mean, they love it. Amen. And then also, don't forget the bookstore uh, created to be uh, his help meet. That's by Debbie Pearl. And then Blue, Bible Blueprint for Building Better Homes. That's by Lonnie Moore. So uh, those are some announcements tonight. I think that's all I got. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. You're right. Would y'all stand, please, and turn to page 28. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, Amen. verse 1 and 3. Come on. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow or turning. Thy kindness, not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence in cheer and Strength for today and the hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine with ten thousand beside. Oh, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
Brother Justice, would you pray, please? Amen. All right, one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. Stand to your feet, if you will, please, and turn to page 144. What a day that will be. Let's get fired up. Come on. Come on. Amen. First and second verse. No third verse in this one. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that rampy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. Think about it. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more birth to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever I will be with the one who died for me oh what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see with that look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be Take your Bibles tonight. Let's stay standing so you don't have to get back up. Amen. Amen. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll look at verse number 10, one verse tonight, and we'll get right into things. That's good singing tonight. Amen. My Amen. goodness. Amen. It's on. I got it on. It's on. All right. Dan's back. He's like a brand new kid back there in the sound booth. Hey, Amen. I'm back here. Amen. But anyway. All right, well, let's look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 10, the scripture says, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Father, again tonight we're thankful for uh, the opportunity to be in church on Wednesday night, and we are thankful for the grace of God. And I pray tonight if there be one in our midst that's not saved, you'd save them. And I pray for Christians tonight that struggle would realize that they have the grace available at every moment Amen. of the day and night. Yeah. That we never should have to fail, Lord, because we have the grace that can give us victory. Now, bless tonight, Father, as only you can, and we're going to thank you for it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to notice that first little phrase. I thought about this. But by the grace of God, I what? I am what I am. Do you realize if it wasn't for the grace of God, you and I wouldn't be anything? Amen? 
Uh, we wouldn't have salvation. We wouldn't have eternal life. But the grace of God is absolutely amazing. And you know, the definition of grace is the unmerited favor of God. Now, pastor for literally weeks has been preaching on grace. Amen. And uh, we're thinking about how that we should live grace, have a grace-filled life. That's what he's been preaching about. But there's no question about how amazing God's grace really is. It's amazing beyond comprehension. And I hope tonight that you're going to see some things about grace maybe we haven't thought about before. And I made this statement. I'll probably say it more than once tonight. The grace of God is something that's indispensable in each one of our lives. We cannot live without it. We cannot go without it. So I think about how our God, what are the three attributes of God? God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. What's the third one? Omnipotent. He's all powerful. And you know what? So is his grace. His grace is absolutely all powerful. And we're going to look at the power tonight of grace, the power of God's grace. Look over at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. We're going to see something about the grace of God and the power that it possesses. The first is this. The grace of God has the power to save us. Amen. Amen? To save your soul and save my soul. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, fa famous, familiar verses. It says, for by what? Grace. Come on, everybody help out. For by grace. grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is no power on this earth invented by man that can save a man's soul. None. And I got some illustrations here. How many of you ever heard of the Lockheed Martin F-35 fighter number two? You've heard of that? Let me tell you something about that plane. I looked up how much horsepower it has. It has 29,000 uh, horsepower of lift. 29,000. I had to look at the zeros again. You think about that. That's powerful. It goes 1,200 miles an hour. Doesn't compare with the grace of God. Amen. Uh, here's another one. Mercedes-Benz EQS. It's a self-driving elective automobile. It has 329 horse, 406 pounds of torque. That's a lot of horsepower and a lot of torque in a car that you're not steering. Amen. And it doesn't have any comparison to the grace of God. And then I think about this. This is the USS Zumwalt. It's a guided missile destroyer. It's a... It's a uh, uh, atomic, uh, how do you say that? A nuclear, that's it. It's a nuclear uh, warship, and it has 104,557 horsepower electric. Now you say, why'd you give all that? Those things don't even compare to the power of the grace of God. Amen? The grace of God has power to do what those instruments do not have the power to do, and nothing compares with the power of God's grace. And I think about this. Here's the deal, though. When somebody realizes the grace of God, that's the problem with the world today. They don't understand grace. They don't understand what preachers have been preaching to you and I as Christians. They don't understand the grace of God and salvation. Without the grace of God, there is no salvation. But I believe without a doubt that the grace of God has the power to soften the hardest sinner and to break through the hardest heart. That's the power of the grace of God. No power on earth is like that. It's God's power. Here's a quote that I saw, and I thought it was quite good. It says, grace alone means that God loves, forgives, and saves us, not because of who we are or what we do, but because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Our best efforts can never be good enough to earn salvation, but God declares us righteous for Christ's sake. We receive that grace through faith alone. Listen, I want to tell you, don't ever, when pastor has been preaching about grace, don't underestimate it. You need to imagine that it's the most powerful thing on the face of the earth. Amen. And then look at Romans chapter 3. Here's another one. Romans 3 and verse 24. God's grace has the power to justify us. Amen. You and I can't do anything to justify ourselves before God, but the grace of God has the power to get it done. Look at Romans 3 and verse 24 and verse 25. It says, being justified freely by his, what's that next word? Grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation 
through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Listen, before salvation, we stood guilty before a holy, righteous God. Uh, God with... Uh, there's nothing we can do to merit salvation, absolutely nothing to justify ourselves, humanly speaking. And we cannot change our position, but it's the grace of God that justifies us. By His grace, we stand today. I asked the other day what grace meant in Sunday school class, and Don spoke up immediately. He said, uh, justified means just as if I have never what? Sin. Boy, it's through the power of God's grace we're justified. Nothing else can do that. Then look, if you would, also, and, and think about this particular one. We'll look at a verse in just a minute, Titus chapter 3. But God's grace has the power to adopt us. You say to adopt us. Yes, exactly. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon says this, and it's about what I'm trying to get across, I guess, but he put it in words. Adoption is that act of God whereby men who were by nature the children of wrath and were of the lost and ruined family of Adam... They are, they are for no reason in themselves, but entirely of the pure grace of God, translated out of evil in the black family of Satan and brought actually and virtually into the family of God. That's the grace of God does that. And then it goes on. So that they take His name, share the privileges of sons, and they are to all intents and purposes the actual offspring and children of God. This is an act of pure grace. No man can ever have a right in himself to become adopted. If I had, then I should receive the inheritance in my own right. But inasmuch as I have no right whatsoever to be a child of God and can by no, possibly, not, no way possibly claim so high a privilege in and of myself, adoption is the pure, gratuitous effect of divine grace and of that alone. How many, how many times do we think about grace having power? But it has the power. It has the power to put us into the family of God. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Look right there if you would. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 through 7. It says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now look at verse 7. That being what? Justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You and I are justified in the eyes of God by the power of God's grace. Unmerited favor of God. We don't deserve it. None of us do. But it's the grace of God that brings it about. Let me read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. And then verse 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of His what? Grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. My goodness, think of it. By the grace of God, we have been adopted into the family of God, and we are now the children of God. That ought to get everybody in here excited. You're sitting out here. Some of you look like you're sucking on a green persimmon. I mean, you ought to think about it. Boy, what a blessing to know the power of God's grace and what it can accomplish. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 7. Here's another. God's grace has the power to forgive us. Wow. To forgive us. Exactly what the Bible says. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood. Now, what's that next two words? The forgiveness of sins according to the what? Riches of His grace. That word riches, it means abundance or valuable uh, bestowment that we get because of the power of God's grace. I think about when you consider who God is. What, who is God? God is number one, He's holy. Number two, He's righteous. Number three, He's perfect in absolutely every way. And do you know what the fourth one is? He abhors sin. And you and I were forgiven by the grace of God. The power of God's grace allows us to be forgiven and to stand in front of Him as we have never sinned. Amen. Yet because of that power of His grace, He can, can forgive sin. And I'm talking about anybody that is willing to come to Him. Right, Dave? I'm going to honk His horn for Him. Nobody else did so far. Gary and Ruth went out to Dave's house last night and Dave got saved. He experienced the forgiveness of God and the power of God's grace to bring him to that point. Amen. Amen. 
Not only does the grace of God provide forgiveness to us, but it enables us to forgive others. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new what? Creature. Before we got saved, most of us didn't have the ability to forgive. But it's the power of God's grace that forgives us, but it also working in us and through us, we can forgive others of what they've done to us. I thought about Ephesians 4.32, and this verse, you ought to memorize it. It says, And be a kind one to another, tender-hearted, what? Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Listen, there's too much unforgiveness even in Christianity today. We have never had anybody do to us what we did unto God, but yet God forgave us. Amen. Amen. The abundant grace, enough for everybody on the face of this earth. And you know what? That grace never loses its power. Never does. Amen. And then look, if you would, at Romans chapter 6. Here's another one. Man, we're flying through this. We'll be done by 10 minutes till tonight. You'll all get out of here early. But look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 8. God's grace also has the power to conquer us. That's a word I've been using a lot lately. And I believe that's an appropriate word for everybody in here tonight. We need to allow the Holy Spirit of God to conquer us. To conquer every part of us. Notice what it says in Romans 6 and verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. There's no reason once we get saved why we should ever let sin have dominion in our life. We don't have to. It's, it's not necessary because now we have an option. The lost world, I think about the lost world, they have no option. If they're lost, they're in sin. Sin is a normal thing. That's what they do. But you and I don't have to anymore. Verse 13, it says, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not, look at this, shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but what? Grace. The power of grace can keep us from sin. We don't have to be involved in sin. I think about the grace has the, the power to conquer any and all situations that we may come along in our life. I thought about this. It has the power to overcome or conquer the hard, cold heart of a lost sinner. It does. It can conquer that heart. Right. Take it over. I, I think about the old man. It can conquer and overcome the old man of days gone by. My life before 1975 was horrible. I don't want to go back there, and I don't have to go back there because of the power of God's grace. Amen? And then I think also the carnal thoughts of our mind. We don't have to have the carnal thoughts in our mind because we have the power of the grace of God that can overcome that. It can conquer that. I thought also about the unchristlike words that come out of our mouth. You say Christians don't talk bad. I'll tell you what, you'd be shocked sometimes over the years that we travel of people who said they're saved and the things that came out of that mouth. But listen, we don't have to do that because we can conquer the mouth. Listen, we can also conquer the fleshly actions of the world. I don't know why anybody that's saved and has had the grace of God bestowed in their life, has saved their soul, has justified them and everything we've talked about, how they can want to go back to the world. Doesn't make any sense. Because they don't have to. I think about how victory for each one of us in here tonight is only a prayer way. You say a prayer way? Yes, say, Lord, I need your grace tonight. Amen. 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 But then look, if you would, at 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. You say, how many are there? 27. God's grace has also the power to be all sufficient for each of us. All sufficiency. That word sufficient means to be enough and adequate. How many times you get saved and, you, you know, you're going to church and you're living for God, but you look around and you see other people that seem to be doing other things that you're not getting to do anymore. And sometimes, they, you know, people feel like we're left out. But you know what? We're not left out. Christ is all sufficient if we will just allow him to be in our life. 
2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, And he said unto me, and this is Paul speaking, My grace is what? Sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Also, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 5, let me read this. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Tonight, what you and I have, the sufficiency we have, and it's real and genuine, it all comes by the power of the grace of God. I think also 2 Corinthians 9, 18. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. All grace. There's nothing that we should not have in our lives that we need that the grace of God will not supply it and be sufficient. I think sometimes we just look beyond what God wants for us, and that's the world coming out. That's the lust of the world coming out. We ought to be satisfied with what God puts on our plate absolutely every day. And God is able to make all uh, grace abound toward you, that all having all sufficiency in all things, you may abound to every good work. I think about how the grace of God is not just for elect, select few. You say, well, it's for preachers, it's for missionaries, evangelists. No, the grace of God is for everybody sitting in here tonight. And you know what the problem is? Maybe you've not thought about that. Maybe you never thought about how God's grace, the power of God's grace could change my life. You ought to be thinking about that. That's what it's all about. It's not just for a, a handful of people. It's for everybody. If you're saved, it's available to you. And I think about a child of God should never say these words, I can't do it, because the grace of God is sufficient for us to get anything done that God wants us to do. It's always adequate for every situation. God, God's grace gives us the ability to live the Christian life to the fullest. You know, I think what's going to be so sad, and it's going to be for all of us, one day when we get to heaven, we're going to find out what we could have had and we didn't. Because we didn't think God was all sufficient. His grace wasn't sufficient. Here's another quote by Spurgeon, and this is really tremendous. Don't become self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is the net Satan uses to catch men like poor silly fish, and then he destroys them. The way to grow strong in Christ is to become weak in yourself. Now listen to this next part. God pours no power into man's heart until man's power is all poured out. Live daily a life of dependence on the grace of God. You know what we need to do every day? Every morning when you get up and you have your quiet time with God, don't ever forget to say, Lord, I need your grace today. I need the power of your grace in my life for every situation. And then look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. We also see that God's grace has the power to make us strong. I don't know about you. You can exercise with weights and you can go to the gym and you can do all that stuff and you can be the biggest spiritual weakling that's ever walked the face of the earth. But God's grace has the power to strengthen and make you and I strong. Look there at 2 Timothy 2, 1. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in what? The grace that is in Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about physical strength. We're talking about spiritual. And we are in a spiritual battle, folks. It's a spiritual battle. It's, it's fighting against that which we cannot see. In fact, look at Ephesians chapter 6, at look, 6 and look at verse number 10 through 17. We've read this several times recently, but I believe it's the truth. We're, we're in a greater battle today in 2023 than we've ever seen in the world's history. And it's a spiritual battle. And it's getting worse, and it's getting worse. Verse number 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, we're in a battle, a spiritual battle, and it's only the grace of God, the power of God's grace, that's going to give us the ability to get through that spiritual battle. 
But it's not only the spiritual battle of the things we can't see, but we have a battle against this world system we live in. And this world system is getting worse and worse. Boy, uh, you go on in, in some of these different Christian talk shows, they talk about what's taking place in Washington and what's going on around the world. Listen, you and I don't have the strength to do that, but God's grace, the power of God's grace can give us the strength to stand. What are we going to do? And I mentioned this last week and maybe the week before. What are we going to do when they come to our churches? What are we going to do when they come to our churches and said, if you continue to meet here, we're going to lock you up? Or what is it going to be if it gets to that point where they come in our churches and say, stand up if you're a born-again believer and you stand up, and if we stand up, they execute us? What are we going to do? How are we going to be strong enough to stand in those times? And those times are coming. I know Brother Donnie has read it and pastors read it, but that that periodical called the, The Voice of the Martyrs. We don't know what persecution in the United States is. But you see these these countries, these second and third world countries, where they have virtually nothing compared to the United States of America. But when they got saved, they got something. And it's the grace of God that allows them to stand. Every day in our prayer list, on, on this one section in the prayer list, it's got for the persecuted Christians and churches right here in the U.S. Hey, we're seeing persecution in the United States of America. It may not be like it is in the other countries of the world, but we're seeing it here in this country where the Christian now is becoming the enemy and we are no longer the one that are upholding the country. Amen. But then I think of around the world. You go over to those Muslim countries. In fact, Pastor, did you get that text today or that, that email from one of ours? They don't even give the name of the family, but it's the number. Missionary so-and-so. And if you go down through there, they're in Muslim countries. And I did you see it today, the numbers? Oh, there are 22,000 that have been saved in the last month in these Muslim countries as a, a result of these people going in with the word of God. But they're, they, you can't even put their name. You can't even use G-O-D. You can't use L-O-D-R-D. If you use those words, they're going to target you and they will kill you. But what are we going to do when it comes here? It's going to be by the power of God's grace that we'll be able to stand and stand our ground. It's by the power of God's grace that we can moment by moment live the victorious Christian life. Remember, the flesh never wins. The flesh always fails. And how often do we try to stand in the flesh? But then the last one, and I'll be done. Look over at 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 16 and 17. God's grace has the power also to comfort us. I think about this verse. It's 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 16. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father, which had loved us and had given us everlasting what? Consolation and good hope through what? Grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. I thought about that everlasting consolation I believe that is regards to our salvation. We have everlasting consolation because Jesus Christ saved our souls. But I think also what it's doing compared to the world's temporal comfort, it's absolutely outstanding. There's nothing to compare to it. And I wonder tonight, is it the, the power of God's grace that gives you comfort? Uh, some people, boy, they go through hard times and they never get over it. They're broken. They're crushed because of it. But God's Grace has the power to give us comfort that nothing or nobody else can. And I think in the times of trials, finding comfort among men and among this world is almost impossible. Yet it's the grace of God that has the power and can console the souls. I think about Charlie, Charlie and Laura. I have no idea what Charlie and Laura are going through now. But I'll tell you what's getting them through. It's the grace of God. It's the power of God's grace that puts his arm around us and holds us close and and gives us the comfort that nobody else can. I think about the Jacksons. I think about Luke and Laney. They had that stillborn baby. I mean, they had a picture of her holding that little baby wrapped in a blanket. You knew that had to be ripping her heart out. We saw Rebecca yesterday and said, how are they doing? She said, they're doing great. You know why they'd be doing great? It's by the power of God's grace to comfort that nothing else can comfort then I think of Jeannie Mae and those little girls. What a tragedy. Now there's a mom with two little girls, no daddy, no husband. And the only way she'll make it is by the power of God's grace to embrace her and comfort her as nothing or no one else can do. Grace will get us through the most trying of times in our life. And you might be going through something tonight nobody has any idea about. 
but it's the grace of God that will get you through it. And here's the thing, grace, we need it to endure this evil world we live in. Every day it's a battle, every day. Remember what I said in the very beginning? The grace of God is something that is absolutely indispensable in our lives. You walk out of here tonight and say, I don't need the grace of God. That's a foolish thing to say because everybody in here tonight needs it. We need to go daily and ask God. I told preacher that day, we ought to get out and stand under that mercy spout and the grace spout. Just, Lord, give me your grace today. I need your grace. I need it all day long. I need it every area of my life. And we have the ability to do that because we can pray and God will hear and answer our prayers according to his will. And his will is that we all enjoy the grace of God. I wonder tonight, do you believe that the grace of God has power to change and do whatever needs to be done in our life? It does. We need to apply it in our lives. That would, that's what we need to do. Let's bow our heads tonight, please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I wonder tonight if there might be just one in this auditorium that if they were to die, they're not sure they're going to heaven. They'd like to be saved before it's everlasting too late. Anybody like that tonight? I wonder how many tonight in this building that you are struggling somewhere, somehow. It may not seem that important to you, but yet, or significant, but it is, because you and I that are saved ought to be living a victorious life and not being in, in, in tangled or, or having problems in any way. My mind is so wrapped up in this thing about God's grace and the power of it, I, I just can't get the words out. God's grace will get us through everything we need. And maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling and you just need the grace of God applied in your life. Why don't you tonight get out of that seat, come to an old-fashioned altar, and be honest with yourself. God already knows. And ask God for the power of that grace to be applied for you, your life, your family, your home, whatever the need might be. Bless tonight. We're going to thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Our heads